Welcome back uh, to The Breakfast and good morning once again. We're going straight into the papers this morning to see what major stories have made the headlines. And uh, we, of course, will be joined by our guests to have a quick analysis on these big stories. Uh, starting this morning with uh, stories from the Punch newspapers. Uh, see what we can quickly find over there. There's uh, one there that says, uh, Strike hits varsities hard. Students battle filth and water and power problems. Uh, San who stops power supply to OAU Senate building threatens total darkness. Uh, we contribute 500 naira per room to clean our hostels, says uh, UNN students, and we defecate in the bush due to, or at night rather, due to lack of water. Just varsity students. That must bring some PTSD to a few people. Uh, let's also see what else. Gas supply increase boosts power generation by 3,358 megawatts, says the NNPC. Buhari, National Assembly, and governors hail Okonje well as emergence as WTO boss. Petrol subsidy may hit 11.2 billion uh, per week. And also Abiodun hosts uh, five northern governors over headsmen attacks today. We can also see that police deploy 6,000 uh, 6, operatives in northwest and north central over banditry. Or your plans panels on the Shasha crisis. Igboho fund hits 22 million naira. And, uh, Ogun, and a man in Ogun State arrested for stabbing his wife to death, um, alleging infidelity. A former uh, a female serial convict jailed three years for issuing a Dodd check. And um, we can also see after forfeiting embezzled money, Yari should be prosecuted, San um, and uh, SAN rather, and others uh, saying. Um, federal government puts border agencies on alert over Ebola outbreak in Guinea. These are the big ones on the um punch newspapers this morning and um i'll start with the ebola story um, um that one you know should be worrying for people because uh we remember how deadly it was you know the last time that it you know happened here in nigeria and uh, i'm not sure if um our health system currently is going to be capable of dealing with both you know at the same time dealing with um covid19 and mm -hmm. ebola um we also know how fast ebola can take your life and so um, let's hope that we make the right moves, and if we if we mean uh, if it's necessary that we close borders or we stop flights or we stop traveling between these two countries, then we should do what is entirely necessary to ensure that we don't get to deal with two pandemics at the same time. Indeed, um, it's, it's definitely scary, and of course, there's you know the strike in universities doesn't oh bring any PTSD. This one, this story really it really hits home because as someone who attended a public university. Even without the strike from non-academic staff workers, I understand what it means to be in these kind of harsh environments. And it's so sad that most students have gotten used to it. Most students in public schools, if you attend a private school, sorry, you can't relate, but this is, these are the horrors we had to go through. You attended uni, Ben, didn't you? So it's uh, not just about one particular I, I stayed at home. university. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> we stayed in the hostels and we went through a lot. Do you know what it meant? Do you know what it means, you know, for these students to say that they had to defecate in the bush at night due to lack of water? A lot of us experienced this. It is this. part of the training. What they say training? don't you know go through the university without letting the university go through what you. What training? So it is part of the life training that you nah, need. I don't agree with that. That's <laughs> suffering. There's a difference yes, it between is, there's a difference between suffering and training. So sorry, don't even it is that part joking. of the training. All so right. it's it's so sad that I remember you know cases back then in school yeah. because of the lack of water, poor facilities in school where you had to do what is called shot put. Yeah, you, can, you can ask your friends what that Can't means, relate. really. So, <laughs> you know, so people would have to defecate in the bush or use a nylon bag. It, it, it got so bad that people, you know, when we, when we got back from school, from the holidays, people began to say stories about how they went home where they had, you know, the toilet facilities, but their immediate instinct when they wanted to use the restroom was to take a nylon yeah. because they were already configured that way. And it's just such really a sad, sad. thing but that also, public institutions uh, are, you know, this bad. It also pushes, you know, the conversation once again for the privatization of your universities. There's people who've mentioned that in the past and said, um, if government can't handle these universities, then, you know, you may as well just, you know, privatize them. Let other people handle them. Because if you look at the difference between federal universities and private universities, state universities even, you know, the, the difference is almost, you know, very clear um, how, you know, the handling is different. Yes, there's some private universities that still lack certain facilities, but um, students who want, or if, if you're looking at, you know, an education system, or an education sector that you expect to bring the best students out, mm -hmm. the most brilliant minds, um, it is 
hard to imagine the you know the what they have to deal with for four years yes. while trying to learn um, and so um, we should do better and of course um, you know we've always said it on the on the program or our guests have always said it right after Asu goes on strike Sanu always yes. follows Nasu always follows um, it seems like clockwork you know it happens every you know the other month and it's um it's really sad I would also quickly speak on um, the um, of course the Okonjo well I just quickly share your thoughts on how that how that you know hits you is 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 a proud moment Ooh. for you listening to Okonjo well uh, really inspires me lots of girls around the world because we saw how we all rallied behind Kamala Harris when she emerged first female vice president of the U.S. and that's almost even double the joy seeing that she's from our place she's from Nigeria she's from Africa we've seen so many African men you know rise up to top positions in you know global organizations and seeing yeah. a woman do that more so somebody in Nigeria somebody from Nigeria somebody who many would argue was not even celebrated enough in her own place and now getting to getting elevated to such a position I mean, I looked at her picture this morning and I said thank you because you just gave me the inspiration that I can do it. Absolutely. So I'm very sure that lots, lots of girls around the world are getting such vibes, such inspiration, are dead and challenged to work harder because you I never know where it may, where it may take uh, you. Before we move to the next paper, I'll also quickly mention, I, I also love the confidence that you see in Okunjo Wela. Um, the World uh, Trade Organization, you know, for, you know, a lot of people might seem, you know, like a scary position mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, to be a DG of that position, but um, of that body rather, but she, she doesn't seem to even be, you know, shaken in any way. It seems like she already knows, you know, her capabilities. She knows that she can handle it. She knows that, yes, even before uh, President Trump left office, you know, there was uh, talk about her not being experienced enough, you know, in that direction. But yes. she doesn't seem to even be bothered by, by all those critics. Indeed. And she's she's going there to actually do what is necessary um, to, to uh, of course, uh, run the place like it should be run. First of all, I, I know that, or we know that, Nigerians are generally confident people. We are so confident, even when we're, we're doing the wrong things, even when we're saying the wrong things, Nigerians just have this confidence in our blood. That's the first thing. Secondly, we know she's, we know the part of, the, of, of Nigeria she's from. She's from a, a group of people that are very vibrant when it comes to trade, when it comes to business. So even though it translates to you know, a more higher position, you know, as the World Trade Organization, yeah. she, you know, she still carries that vibe, you know, of she still carries that spirit, that biz business enthusiasm. And I believe that she can definitely deliver a great Absolutely. job, you know. And so, yes, good to know we have our guest uh, right now joining us uh, via Zoom. Good morning. Right, uh, good morning, my sister. Thanks You're for joining us. You're looking gorgeous. You're also looking very cute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We've been sharing our thoughts on, on the big story, the emergence of Ngozi Okonjaiwela as the DG of the World Trade Organization. The story here is on the front page of the Punch newspaper. It says, Buhari National Assembly governors hail Okonjaiwela's emergence as WTO boss. What's your take on this? Hey, Liz. Uh, it's a beautiful day for Nigeria. It's a beautiful day for Africa. The whole of the black race should be proud of this, uh, that Ongonjo Wella is um, setting a record. You and I will know that she's going to be the first woman to head the WTO. She's also going to be the first black person to head WTO. And uh, given her experience, we have no doubt that she's like she will uh, put the tractors to shame. You and I will remember that she has had a very tortured journey to getting to clinching the post of uh, the chief executive of WTO. Uh, the man who was president before now in the US appears not to be somebody disposed to see a black skin and an African for that matter coming from the so-called shit O to become the chairman, I mean to become the chief executive officer of the WTO. And he did everything humanly possible to, to frustrate, to ensure that Okondo Wella does not emerge. But somehow, divine intervention came from somewhere in the sense that um, the evil man who has been unraveling what the entire world has uh, carefully and basically put together since the world wars, who began to unravel them, got voted out of office. And a new person or a new president 
in the passing of Bidi, uh, became uh, the president. Okay. And Bidi is someone who is disposed to, who has no prejudice with regards to people's color, the background in which they are coming from, and the religion that they do profess. Right. And it's because of this that Bukonde Uwela has been able to mount the shadow. Okay, Mr. Kawali. When you also remember that we are packing with me, I'm both, I'm packing with me at um, the African Development Bank, you can see that the Nigerian nation is on the ascendancy. Sure. And more of CC years to come, mm. if we are able to get our act right here at home. Mr. Kolawele, let's quickly turn to another newspaper. Let's look at the nation now. This one yeah. says, North governors in Ibadan over growing ethnic tension. It says, Bagudu, Sani Bello, Kanduje, Matawale meet stakeholders. IG deploys special squad in Oyo State. Bandits now attack soldiers, says Erufai. Matari says, security is a joint responsibility. And this one here on page eight of the nation says, tolling won't resume at Leki soon, says LCC. Lai Mohammed, Kwara APC, disagree over party's membership registration. We also see the story here of Kunje Wela saying she will take the WTO to greater heights. And eligible Nigerians to pre-register for COVID-19 vaccine, 57 million doses coming. Mr. Kolawali, um, let me get your thoughts on, uh, let's start with this one on COVID-19 vaccine. We first had, you know, high hopes when the government announced that we we're expecting about 100 doses of the vaccine before the end of January. And then they moved the dates to February and later said the vaccines will not come anymore and they're looking in other directions. And now we're seeing a new story, 57 million vaccines, 57 million doses coming and eligible Nigerians to pre-register. What are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, just like uh, in other areas of our lives, the Buhari administration, the APC administration, has been wumbling and fumbling on almost all issues with regards to the welfare and well-being of the Nigerian nation. One would have thought uh, that immediately the uh, corona pand uh, coronavirus pandemic broke out that Nigeria would uh, have its own martial plan and seek us to conquer the epidemic. But lo and behold, we haven't seen that. If I were the president, for example, I would have assembled uh, homegrown experts to look at the possibility of really providing, I mean, of producing our own vaccine here at all. It is not something that we cannot do here. We have done things that are better than that in the past. You and I will know that Nigeria has some of the best virologists in the world, we have some of the best epidemiologists in the world. We have some of the best uh, um, public health uh, in the past been producing vaccine until somebody saw that right on the platter of both a funny company and enter into an agreement that Nigeria will not produce any vaccine whatsoever in the next 30 years. But that is an agreement we could have found a way to overcome and then assemble our own expert to begin to produce. Because look, it's natural that if other nations put their experts on ground and then their resources on ground and all that, and able to provide the, to produce this vaccine, they will not consider you first. They will first consider their own citizens. It is when they are particularly taking care of their own citizens and then they begin to extend the chest up to you. And if that is the case, that is why we should have had an homegrown plan to produce our own vaccine. Okay. So I am not surprised about what is the. Uh, they're coming from those places now. We could only be, I mean, a bank and then see ourselves uh, at the mercy of uh, this country that have been able to produce uh, uh, this. Wow. It's a very shameful thing. You and I could see what they have started doing. Some of them have been sneaking abroad to take this vaccine. We saw a Tiku uh, briefly uh, advertised on the social media when he was taking the vaccine in, uh, in uh, Dubai. Some other top gun Nigerians have also sneaked abroad uh, to go and uh, take these vaccines. It is because they know they will always have such opportunity that really they really don't care whether you have an homegrown right, program so to fight this COVID-19 thing or not. And more importantly, too, most of the top people that you have in this country are not really citizens of this country. They are an expatriate uh, leaders that we have. Uh, Bukola Saraki is a British citizen. 
uh, fire shares, American uh, passport. So, so let's so, so we don't move away from it. Is an American citizen. The... Ditto for some of these other mm -hmm. well, But the Pia Mila is also an American citizen. Ditto for some of these other hold on, Mr. Kolawole. They know that when they come from the... They could only speak to some of these other countries. Mr. Kolawole, can you hear us? I'm, I'm not sure if you can, but um, please hold on so we don't move away from the... Uh, main focus, which is, of course, the uh, vaccines and how the Nigerian government will be able to successfully vaccinate all Nigerians. Let, let's see what we can find on the Nigerian Tribune this morning. There's a few um, interesting ones over there. Uh, of course, they're still talking about um, insecurity and uh, the Shasha mayhem. It says, Kano Kebi Niger, Zamfara, Governor Zinibado, meet uh, uh, Makinde. Um, also, um, um, Okonjo Wala emerges a woman, or first woman, an African DG of WTO. Um, we can also find that Nigeria on alert of a new Ebola outbreak in Guinea. WIAC releases November, December 2020 exam results, withholds 5,548. And also, Lai Mohammed demands cancellation of APC registration in Kwara State. Here in Lagos, LCC speaks on bank debts, uh, ownership, and fate of over 500 workers. Troops kill 81 Boko Haram fighters in Sambisa, lose one soldier. And gunmen kill four, burn 28 houses in Plateau State. Um, all right, let, um, Mr. Kolawale, let's um, talk uh, security now. Um, uh, I think we can give kudos. I guess we can give kudos to our Nigerian troops uh, for their successes yesterday in um, um, the fight against Boko Haram. Uh, would you say that, of course, this, you know, is um, one more step towards somehow, some way ending the existence of Boko Haram in Nigeria? I hope so, my brother. I hope so, my brother. And when you look at the history of a guerrilla warfare, such as we are facing with this Boko Haram thing, it is very, very difficult to predict that the war might come to an end very, very soon. In some countries of the world, uh, this kind of internecine guerrilla warfare has been going on for, for more than 50 years in a place like uh, Guatemala. If you also go to Afghanistan, look at what the Mujahideen or whatever, whatever they call them, look at what they've been doing in Afghanistan for almost about uh, 30 years in now. So when you look at, uh, when you take into cognizance the development in the other parts of the world and all that, you really cannot say that uh, the renewed offensive against the Boko Haram my signal the end of that uh, war that is going on uh, in the northeast. But be that as it may, we must commend our troops uh, for the gallantry that they have started showing since the change in leadership of the top echelon of the Nigerian uh, army. We do know that the Nigerian soldiers have the capacity to deal very decisive uh, blow against the Boko Haram. What has been lacking is uh, quality leadership and then the right uh, armament and also a kind of incentive motivation for the troops to really do the, the needful. Because until you have put some of these things on ground, you really cannot get the best from um, uh, your soldier. More importantly too, we have left this war for too long for soldiers alone to fight and win. And the truth of the matter is that uh, soldiers alone have never won any war anywhere in the world. It is even people outside the army that mostly will do come out with very, very important and strategic ideas that is likely to make a country uh, win the war. I'll give you two examples. When the Nigerian civil war was uh, going on, you and I will know that uh, Gowon, who was head of the Adapio in time, formed a war cabinet. And the war cabinet was headed by Chibawal Mawolo. He came up with most of the profound ideas that led them um, to the, to the winning of the Nigerian civil war on the part of the Nigerian side. I will always say, look, if you want to win this war, cut off food supplies to your adversaries. Uh, when people are hungry, they hardly will be able to, they hardly will be able to do it on the battlefield. I will also suggest that change the Naira. If you change the Naira and then they don't have access to your currency, okay? nobody is likely to accept their own uh, uh, currency for purchases in the international market and all that. I would also suggest that instead of borrowing money, why don't you use the deposits of the people you are fighting to prosecute this war? Go reach out to all the banks to make available all the deposits of your adversaries and then you begin to make use of it to prosecute the war. Okay. He also said 
the United States didn't want to borrow money to prosecute the world. They said, look, give me some vibrant, intelligent, and honest men. He put them in custom, in strategic revenue, federal government generating them, outfits and all that. And they plug all the loopholes in there. And then the revenue began to show it was all those strategic ideas that they came from okay. Maulo, that led to the winning of the war. Because in Mr. the war Kowale, against the Boko Haram, we're running out of time. The Nigerian soldiers, Mr. Uh, Kowale, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time at this moment. So indeed, we can go back uh, to look at history and see what strategies have been employed in the past and that we can use right now. But let's quickly turn to the Guardian newspaper to just touch one story for less than a minute. On The Guardian, it says Nigeria responds to new Ebola outbreak. It also says couple bags 40 years jail term for 53 million naira fraud. And we also see the story saying Wayek withholds result of 5,548 Wayek candidates. So these are the stories here on the front page of The Guardian newspaper. Which of them would you like to address in less than a minute, please? I would like to comment on the visit of the northern governors uh, to Oyo State with regards to the crisis that is going on in uh, Shasha. Honestly speaking, those northern governors have no sense of shame. If they have a sense of shame, they will not embark on the kind of journey that they have, have embarked upon. And it wouldn't be the first time we are going to be seeing it. You will remember when Alaji Lamadeshina was the governor of Oyo State, there were also crises between uh, Katu Fula and, his, and the farmer in um, Okeo area. That is the Gaga where you brought them in, where Sunday Go went and did some things uh, uh, not too long ago. And then uh, Muhammad Ubali then, as a retired head of state and all that, came to your state to start lambasting, lamentation, and then uh, telling all sorts of fictitious stories that the Yorubas were killing the Fulanese. And uh, we are at it was actually the Fulanese that were killing the farmers in the Okeo area of uh, your state. And uh, thank God, Lamadation, a very smart person, gave it to General Buhari in a very, very polite manner. That is what I expect Makinde to also do. Because the crisis that we are seeing all over the country today, with regard to this banditry and all that, the Northern Dela and the Northern governors are directly responsible. And I will tell you why. Look at the, 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 the Almond Jiriti. They have refused to send their children to school. And if you refuse to send children to school, and you also fail to equip them with the necessary skill for survival in life and all that. Tendencies are that they are likely to graduate into Boko and become bandits, and then uh, wayward elements that we have continued to see. Also see the influence of these children from the northern parts of the country, the southwest, and then the south and the southeast and all that, to do million jobs, selling kolano, selling pure water, riding okada, riding um, um, uh, kekemarwa, and uh, what have you. If they are taking responsibility to educate their children and all that, some of these things that we are seeing within Abendia also require that the certification is a problem. And we almost say, we call the geographers have been warning you know, that there's going to be desertification. That it will come to a time because of urbanization and because of desertification, there will be no more grazing lands in any part of Nigeria. And if the northern allies are taking the pain to educate their people, on modern way of animal husbandry. And then we, the crisis that we continue to have now between the, the others and then the farmer, which is available, rather all the ecological funds that are made available to the Netherlands, to the Netherlands governor to do afforestations and all that, they embed to this. They stole all the money. One or two of them is right, in investment, ecological funds and all that. So it is the theory of leadership on the part of the now to educate their people and also to embrace this. All right. Um, unfortunately, we've uh, completely run out of time. Uh, but of course, a very interesting point that uh, he was making there. Um, what exactly is the conversation um, going to be like between those northern governors and uh, Governor Shei Makinde? And whose responsibility really should it be to ensure that there is peace in all your state and all across the southwest at a time like this? Uh, thank you very much, Tunde Kolawali. It's always very interesting speaking with you. I like your perspectives every now and then. Uh, we hope that we can um, bring you in once again pretty soon. Coming up next, we have uh, Today in History. We'll tell you a little bit of what, uh, what happened on this day, the 16th of February, many, many years ago, here on The Breakfast. <laughs>